So our uh, next speaker is going to be Perry Markle. Uh, Perry is with Evolution 2.0 and is co-founder of the Cancer and Evolution uh, working group with the American Association of Cancer. And the title of his talk is Agency of the Cell, Convergence Between Origin of Life, Evolution, Cognition, and Cancer. And since we had a late start, we'll look to finish the overall uh, session at, at 5 uh, to 12. Uh, so we'll carry on from there. All right. All right. You're on camera. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Perry Marshall. I'm from Chicago. And this is on the upper left. This is my dad. And uh, this is, uh, he's in his office. Uh, he was a minister uh, when I was 14. He got cancer in his kidney and he had surgery and had the kidney taken out. And about a year and a half later, I was... Down in the basement, it was a summer day, about this time of year, and I heard him come in the back door at three o'clock in the afternoon, which was not typical, because he usually worked till five. And my mom was surprised he was home, and he says, uh, well, honey, the cancer is back. And she went to pieces, and uh, she was kind of a wreck for about the next two months, and we lost him. Uh, 15 months later, I was 17 and he was 44. Uh, on the upper right, uh, closest thing in my adult life that I had to a dad, a gentleman named Tom Hubiar who lived in California. Uh, he died of pancreatic cancer. And I was with him the last week of his life in the hospital and pancreatic cancer, as many of you know, is horrific. Uh, and that was, uh, that was in 2011, wonderful guy. On the lower left, uh, Neil Peart, the drummer for Rush. The first time I saw him play, I think it reimagined what I conceived music to be. I'd never seen a musician like that. Uh, and then uh, almost by accident, I ended up at a Van, Van Halen concert once. And that guy on the right is Eddie Van Halen. And I remember he's playing his guitar and he's the only person on the stage and his legs are dangling over the... Uh, the edge of the stage and he sounded like Mozart or something and it was just brilliant. So uh, all four of them lost to cancer. So um, uh, that's a financial disclosure. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so uh, Two and a half years ago, I got a email from my friend, James Shapiro, who is a bacterial geneticist at the University of Chicago. And I think he's one of the best evolution people alive. And he said, he said, uh, hey, Perry, um, some friends of mine and I are putting together a cancer and evolution symposium in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, will you help us organize this thing? And uh, I said, absolutely, and we did that. And uh, um, the conference ended up being on Zoom because of the pandemic, but it was a, a, a success, absolutely. And it brought a whole bunch of people together from a whole bunch of different fields and became part of the American Association of Cancer Research. We are now one of their official working groups and the group has about 1500 members. And so the last two and a half years, I have taken a deep dive into cancer. Now, the reason I got the email in the first place was because I wrote a book called Evolution 2.0, Breaking the Deadlock Between Darwin and Design. And there's about two pages in that book where I talk about cancer. And I say that cancer is the cells of your own body evolving out of control at incredibly high speed and with incredible intelligence. And, and so... I'm going to go over some things that I have discovered as a result of being in the cancer field for the last two and a half years. Um, between 2002 and 2014, 72 new anti-cancer drugs were introduced, and they prolonged survival by an average of 2.1 months. That's a fact. 
and two-thirds of cancer drugs approved in the last two decades have shown zero survival improvement. And um, it's, it's not good. In fact, if you look at 2020 age-adjusted mortality, and you look at that graph, there's a very slight decline in cancer mortality over the last 100 years, mostly correlated to a decline in smoking. And we are not winning the war on cancer. In December was the 50 year anniversary of Richard Nixon declaring the war on cancer and we've spent a quarter of a trillion dollars on it. And I just told you the results that we've got. And uh, Isra Raza, a friend of mine at Columbia University, she's a force of nature and she's been treating leukemia for the last 35 years. She says, improvement in survival of cancer patients is measured in weeks and regularly referred to as a game changer. And they have victory laps and do billion dollar IPOs, but that's really, uh, that's really the truth. And um, if you read Henry Hang, which is another brilliant researcher, he, he describes in great detail the tremendous power of cancer cells to out-evolve radiation and chemotherapy. And the word evolve is very significant because that's exactly what's going on. Um, now, Michael Levin is a researcher at Tufts University um, that I've um, had quite a few interactions with. And Michael has done experiments on tadpoles where by changing the communication signaling between cells and the cells around him, he is able to induce cancer at will. Sort of like, think of uh, refugees um, isolated in a refugee camp and becoming angry and turning into militants. You could sort of think of it like that. It's, it's a, all biology is social, all the way down to the, the bacteria level. And so think of isolating a group from another group until they feel alone and isolated. They eventually take charge. And so he forms tumors by cutting off cellular communication. And then after restoring cellular communication, the cancerous cells revert back to normal cells at will. Now, you would think that people would be all over this like the Manhattan Project, but they're not because it doesn't fit the standard models of how cancer is believed to work. Um, Jin Song Liu is a pathologist, MD Anderson, and uh, he wrote a brilliant series of papers um, with this diagram here that you see on the right. And what he shows is that when a, when a um, at the very, very beginning of pre-cancer in what, what he calls a giant cell, um, the cell goes, um, a, a group of, of cells goes into a state that is very, very similar to embryonic development, except it's like a dark evil twin of embryonic development. And it turns into a tumor and um, whereas an embryo stays in an evolutionary state for about five days and downloads a whole bunch of epigenetic information for the purpose of adapting to its environment um, as the parent is passing environmental signals to their child, um, in, a, in an embryo, it comes, it comes out of that state in about five days, a tumor stays in that state permanently. So a tumor is a group of cells that it's in, in a permanent state of evolution. And so when you hit them with chemo and radiation, they just diversify from one species to a thousand species, and then there's no drug that'll ever take out a thousand different species of cells. And, and, and then your sister-in-law dies after her numbers were going down and looking very promising. And, uh, and, and everybody's at her funeral four months later. 
Um, Henry Hing at Wayne State University in Detroit has um, done some brilliant work on karyotypes in cancer. So karyotype is the physical shape and arrangement of the chromosome in a three-dimensional matrix, which is a whole level of information above genetic information. So it's, it's a degree of organization of genetic information that most people ignore. But he says, um, rapidly evolving cancer cells make massive rearrangements to the karyotype shape of the chromosome, and they are searching a probabilistic space for ways of evading therapy. Now, my observation is that the thing that is driving this can only be labeled as cognition. And I am defining cognition as the total set of mechanisms and processes that underlie information acquisition, storage processing and use at any level of organization. And cancer is evolution running out of control. And all types of cells are capable of autonomous behavior in certain situations. And if you want to look into that more deeply, watch a TED Talk by Michael Levin, absolutely fascinating. And so therefore, cancer is a struggle of information and intent. So I believe that the central question of life itself is cognition. Um, and I believe that cognition which is the ability of an agent to sense and act, and I use the word agent very deliberately, agency. It's the key actor in the origin of life, the origin of the genetic code, evolution, consciousness, and artificial intelligence, and cancer. And um, in 2019, I organized a private equity investment group and a bunch of investors put up $10 million and we announced at the Royal Society a $10 million prize. And the prize is an, um, a reward for an answer to where did the genetic code come from or how can you get any kind of coded information from a purely chemical process? The fact is, is that all codes that we know of come from biology. Nobody knows any way of getting a code without biology generating the code. Okay, so there's something very special about biology. And all known codes are the result of choices like computer programs and human language and all that. And so I really believe that the question that we're looking for here is where does choice come from? Which um, goes back to, I, I believe, Erica Carl Carlson gave a talk about determinism and free will. I, I, I think this is the central question in biology too. Um, and so, my observation is that there are three levels of activity in biology. There is physics and chemistry, and there is code, and there's cognition. And that traditionally, the, the story that you're always told in textbooks and the media and everything is that first there was chemical physics and chemistry, and then there was a warm pond and a lucky lightning strike, and then it produced some self-replicating RNAs, and that created a code, and then the code evolved into life, and then life became cognitive. Well, in 18 years of studying this subject, I have never seen any example in any literature showing that physics and chemistry produce codes. And I have never seen any example in the 18 years that I've been in this field of codes producing cognition. What we observe in every system that we understand is that cognition creates codes and any first year biology student knows that the genetic code controls the chemical reactions, not the other way around. And so I believe that we've gotten cause and effect backwards in biology for 100 years. If there's a way around this, I would love for somebody to show up with a solution because 
we'll pay you $10 million for it and we'll patent it. And it's probably as valuable as anything as Nikola Tesla or Albert Einstein ever discovered. But nobody knows what it is yet. Now, Barbara McClintock was a brilliant scientist who in the 1940s proved that cells actively reconstruct and reorganize their own genome. And her colleagues thought she was crazy, but she turned out to be right and she got the Nobel Prize in 1983. Um, epigenetics is a hugely growing field and one of the most interesting epigenetics factoids that I've ever encountered is that the number one effect of secondhand smoke on children is epigenetically inherited asthma from a smoking grandmother. And that's the number one effect on children is epigenetic. So the grandmother could have died and the daughter never met the grandmother, but the daughter has asthma because grandma smoked. Um, new species can develop in weeks and months. Um, another aspect of cognition is self, non-self identification, which is intrinsic to any immune system. It's found in bacteria, it's found in cancer. It's most accurate, I believe, to think of cancer as the cells of your own body having become a separate organism, they have their own identity, they're not you anymore, they are competing for your own body's resources, and they are evolving purposefully to outwit whatever the immune system or therapies are thrown at it. Well, cognition expresses agency, and the only known source of agency in the universe is biology, which uh, Cronin Walker said in, 19, uh, in 2016. And we do not know any way to get choices from physical interactions. And since all codes we know uh, the origin of come from biology, the, the, the real question is, the question that Barbara McClintock asked in her 1984 Nobel Prize paper. And the question she asked was, what does a cell know about itself? And so we've gotten cause and effect backwards. And so let's talk about what choice is. So I'm defining choice as non-deterministic action of a free agent with sensory capacity and memory not computable from prior states. If it's computable from prior states, it's just an algorithm. But as, we, as any AI person who's honest can tell you, algorithms don't make choices, you just program them. Um, uh, and, and whatever happens is a, is a, it flows from the axioms of the original program. And so, this is why I don't believe that we can reduce cancer to any single mechanical thing or algorithmic model. It's really a question of the will. And so I believe that we have to treat cancer as an autonomous purposeful agent with a unique identity and a capacity to choose. And we, and we have to ask the question, how do we persuade cancer to want to do something different? When Michael Levin restored the cellular communication and caused tumors to reverse back to normal cells, he was solving a communication problem. And isn't that what you would do with a, you know, a group of refugees that are getting out their guns and wanting to go kill everybody? Wouldn't you sit down and talk to them. And I, and I also know, I, I did a podcast interview with a psychologist na named Eric Kulker, and he said there's extensive research that it does not get talked about very much that um, children with adverse childhood experiences exceeding a certain number are three to four times more likely to get cancer and heart disease as adults than people who don't, and that psychotherapy can measurably reduce those numbers. And so 
I believe that the origin and nature of information is the biggest question in science that can be precisely defined. And I also believe that it's intimately related to curing cancer. So we have a dilemma. Chemicals cannot, in principle, solve cancer if cancer is really a disease of identity and volition. Rules and algorithms can't do it. Therefore, we have to treat it as an organism that's making a choice. And so I would propose to you that these six things in the blue circles, cancer, origin of the genetic code, origin of life, AI, consciousness, and evolution, are not six questions, they're really one question. The question is, what is cognition and where does it come from? And I'm ready for questions. Thank you. Terrific. And we, uh, we have some time for questions. A couple. I'll try and deliver this or not. Hi, thanks for sharing. Super interesting talk. I'm curious, maybe I just misunderstood, um, but when you're talking about how do, like when you're talking about the pyramid thing, mm -hmm. um, how do like dynamic complex systems or emergence play into like those quote choices? You know what I mean? Yes, well, so I think a, a very good way to conceptualize the question is with an analogy. If you, if you walk into a pizza shop and you see a guy handing the cashier a $5 bill and the cashier is handing him a, p a piece of pizza, you could say, where, does the, where did the $5 come from? And where did the piece of pizza come from? And, wh and then where does the $5 bill go? Well, the $5 comes from a hundred different things that the guy might have done that day. And it comes out of his bank account at a certain date and at a certain time. And the pizza comes from a thousand different places and ends up on a plate, right? There's cheese, there's heat for the building, there's air conditioning, there's all the ingredients. And so if you look at, if you look at this, if I can, I don't know, I don't think I can find the slide, I'm sorry. You have the flow of information, which I'm an electrical engineer by, by profession, and information is always created top down, created and encoded top down, and it's always decoded bottom up. And there's always an agent at both ends. And so your question is really too complex to fully answer and we can, on breaks, we can talk about it all you want. But many times when people sit, talk about emergence, they're giving you an outcome, not an explanation. I totally agree that emergence occurs, but many times it's just a fig leaf for saying, well, I don't really know how that works. Um, so you could say that life is an emergent property of millions of years of the ocean, but you haven't really explained anything. So um, cause and effect is very complex and agency is fractal. So the tadpole um, with no cancer is a single agent, but a, a tadpole with cancer is two agents. And then when he got the cancerous cells to revert back to normal cells, the two agents went back to being one agent. So I think this raises huge questions that we are only beginning to scratch. Okay, we have uh, one more question here. Yeah, thanks Perry, back here. Um, so um, I guess one question of mine would be uh, when, when different like quote unquote species of uh, cancer or cancer cells are, are, um, are being noticed in an individual who has cancer, do you see these as sort of different factions, I guess, drawn from your analogy 
of different refugees forming different factions that could even, I guess, have um, war with each other. So can, can these different uh, species of cancer interact with each other in, an, in a way that's adverse to themselves? Yes, so any, any micro environment in the human body is subject to Darwinian evolution. And there's resources, right? So not only do you have, you might, you might have the tumor um, working as a single unit and competing with the body, but you could also have multiple tumors in multiple parts of the body or multiple cell types in one tumor all competing for resources on their own, right? And so at some point, the mutiny can just continue to divide and divide. And we've all experienced this because we've all seen a cancer patient go downhill very rapidly and lose all their weight and look terrible and not be able to breathe and not be able to speak and all of that. And that's because a, a second organism has taken over their body. Let's uh, thank Perry once uh, more for a fascinating thank presentation. You. Thank you. Thank you.